The Fourth Stall, Chapter 24 Monday passed quickly, too quickly. For once, I wanted the hours in the day to drag, to last forever. And for once, class time flew by. Funny how that works, isn't it? For the most part, Fred and I didn't talk during any of the recess or lunch breaks. He played DS while I sat in my office, going over my final books, trying to predict whether or not Staples would actually show up after school. Right at the end of afternoon recess, I called Fred into my office. Yeah, he said as he stepped into the fourth stall from the high window. Fred, do you think you could meet me here after school today? I asked. Sure, I guess. My mom said she'd be home late today anyways. Thanks. Just meet me here at 325. The door will be open. Okay, he said, standing up. I guess I'll see you then. He opened the, st the stall's door. Oh, Fred, and one last thing, I said, prompting him to stop before leaving the stall. Don't be late. Okay, he said. The bell rang a short time later. I had just a few hours left until the meeting with Staples. Maybe only had a few hours left to live, depending on how it would all go down. After class, I packed my stuff into my backpack and trudged across the school to my office. My stomach ached like it knew something I didn't, which was a strange feeling for me. I wasn't used to being so nervous and jittery all the time. Just a few weeks ago, I had been in total control of this school, or I thought I had been. Now... I had been reduced to nothing but some friendless, penniless kids, kid with a key to an abandoned bathroom in the boonies of a school's east wing. The halls were crowded that day, but the kids didn't shout greetings like they normally did. I had been pretty popular around here simply because of what I could do for people, but lately kids seemed to care less. I think they knew my business was all but finished. Too many kids had witnessed my surrender plea to Justin Friday night at the football game, and my office had hardly been open at all in the past two weeks. I got to the East Wing entrance and waited there for the janitor. He locked the door every day at 3.20. Only two of the school's eight entrances remained unlocked after 3.30, and those only stayed open until 4 o'clock. Hey, Mac, how are you? He said as he reached for the keys. I'm okay. Say, a friend of mine is coming to visit me. Do you think you could leave this one open until four today? I asked. Sure, no problem, he said, and walked back down the hallway. He whistled some catchy tune that I recognized from somewhere. Just like that, no questions asked. You don't ask questions that don't need to be answered. That's rule number one when dealing uh, with a business like mine. And the janitor seemed to understand that. He was by far the coolest adult I had ever met. Kids in most schools make fun of their janitors because it's usually some creepy guy with gross hair, a funny smell, and a collection of bent spoons in his work closet. But our janitor is downright awesome. I went inside the bathroom and sat in my office. Fred entered a few moments, moments later. I heard him sit in one of the chairs across from the sink. It was three minutes until, until 3.30. I wasn't sure if Staples would show, and if he did... Could I go through with it? The first question was answered just a minute later when the door to the bathroom swung open and I heard heavy footsteps scuff across the, dirt, the dirty tile floor. Then I heard Fred's voice. Staples, what are you doing here? Fred didn't sound all that shocked to see Staples, though. You'd have thought he would sound terrified, but he didn't. There was a silence, and then Fred spoke again. Uh, Mac, Staples is here. Why is Staples here? I got up and stepped out of my office. Fred was still seated in this plastic chair, and Staples stood by the sink just a few feet away. They were both looking at me. Oh, Fred, I think you know why Staples is here, I said. Fred shook his head. I don't. I don't know what, but Staples cut him off. So I heard you finally want to accept my offer. Having problems with your business, are you? I looked at Staples with a blank face. I didn't really feel all that afraid of him anymore, because this time for once, I actually did have the drop of him. This time, I had the element of surprise. I guess you could say that, I said, trying to sound calm, bored, but I mostly definitely do not want to accept your offer. His eyes narrowed. Then why am I here? I don't like being jerked around, Christian. Yeah, well, I don't like being jerked around either, Barry. He shook his head and took a deep breath. He looked so shocked that I knew his real name that I thought he might have a heart attack right there in my office. How... How do you know my name? He demanded. All in due time, I said. First, I have an offer to make you. Well, it's more the demand than an offer. One, I want you out of my school forever. I don't want to hear about you and any of my, from any of my classmates placing bets with one of your bookies again. Two, I don't ever want to see you or any of your high school cronies near my friends ever again. Staples laughed. He had gone from, a scowl, from scowling and confused to laughing in just seconds. 
in just a second's time. So, so he tried to talk, but was too busy laughing. I waited while he calmed down. Eventually, he composed himself enough to say, so what exactly are you going to do if I refuse your offer? When he said the word offer, it made he made bunny ears with his two fingers from each of his hands and then curled his fingertips downward. Well, right now, as we speak, a few friends of mine are currently raiding the shed in your backyard. They're going to kidnap your dog, search the place, and take any, mo any money or information that they find. They're going to call me in the next few minutes to confirm all this. And if I don't answer, they'll know something is wrong. And they'll take your dog out to a field and leave him there, call the cops and give them all the stuff they found. Keep all your cash, which to answer your question is also basically what will happen if you refuse our offer. I made the same bunny ears curled downward gesture, then pulled my phone from my pocket so Staples could see it. I don't believe you, he said, but he was no longer smiling. No, your address is 1808 Academy Road South. Your dog is a pit bull with a pink camouflage collar. Your office is in the shed in your backyard, and you have a pretty remarkable bobblehead doll collection. My friends will use my friends will use a bolt cutter to break into your shed. They'll use sleeping pills to disarm your dog. Oh, and they better find an emergency in game funds too, because I want those back. Staples shook his head. He looked a little shocked and maybe a little scared, but also very, very angry. He rubbed his left eye and then balled his hand into a fist. His knuckles turned white as snow. But I don't have your stupid little funds. How could I have stolen them? I don't even know where they are, he snarled. I know, but your snitch does. I turned to Fred. His eyes went wide. I continued. Fred knew where I hid my funds, and he told you where they were. Then, breaking into my room Thursday afternoon probably wasn't all that hard, was it, Barry? Considering that you found my window open, I still can't believe that Fred had been working for you all this time. I looked down at him in the chair. Fred looked away quickly. I knew it was you, Fred. You broke my heart. He looked at his feet. I could tell he was ashamed of himself. He shook his head and whined. He made me do it, Mac. Whatever, Fred. It doesn't matter now. I looked back at Staples. You see, I found my Nintendo DS inside your desk, Staples, when I broke into your shed on Sunday, on Saturday. It struck me as odd that you would be into DS, being that most of its games are for little kids. So I powered it up and found some pretty shocking messages from Fred in the inbox. All the time I thought Fred had been playing games on his DS, he was really taking notes with the stylus and sending them to you. I also found a few records in the little in the filing cabinets detailing who's still in your payroll, and sure enough, Fred is listed, and Vince isn't. Up to that point, I really had thought Vince was with a snitch and had stolen the funds. I really believed that Fred was innocent and had been telling the truth about everything that I was ruined, and uh, that I was ruined. It had all added up. It had all made such perfect sense, and that's because. That's what you had wanted me to think all along, isn't it, Staples? You're clever, I have to admit it. You staged everything to make me think Vince stole the funds, and it was the snitch. Staples just stared at me and didn't say anything. Sure, I was happy when I found out I was wrong, that my best friend hadn't stabbed me in the back, but the news had also hit me like a three-ton semi-truck going 100 miles per hour, because it meant that I questioned my best friend's loyalty in the worst way imaginable. And thinking back to everything I'd said to him, no wonder he was so angry that he could barely even talk or deny my accus accusations. I'd acted like a true jerk not to trust him or even give him the chance to explain, which made it extra hard to go visit him on Sunday morning to try to apologize. When I got to his trailer and his mom answered the door, the first thing I saw in her face was relief when I, when, and then a smile. Christian, I'm so glad you're here, she said. I don't know what happened between you guys on Thursday, and it's none of my business, but he's barely even left his room since then. He hasn't changed, showered anything. I can barely get him to eat. I hadn't thought I could feel much worse up to this point, but I had been wrong. I wanted to compose myself and let some crazy lady use me as fertilizer for her tomato plants, compost myself, and use some and use some crazy lady to, as fertilizer for tomato plants. I wanted to cover myself in honey and then get lowered slowly into a huge vat of fire ants. I wanted to strip the skin off my arms with a cheese grater and then take a lemon and juice bath. I wanted to poke a sleeping lion in the ribs with a short stick. I wanted, okay, you probably get the idea. Well, I'll see what I can do, I said, walking past Vince's mom. I went to his room and saw the sign that 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 sign I'd given him for his birthday was no longer hanging on the door. Really, 
Would there ever be an end to just how uh, low I could feel? I knocked. Nothing. I knocked again. Again, nothing. I slowly opened the door and poked my head inside. What I saw, I will never forget, though I wish I could. Vince was lying on his bed, wearing the same clothes he'd been wearing on Thursday when we had our fight. His face was the color of cigarette smoke, or one of the George Romero's zombies. His eyes were vacant, and he lay motionless, and for a second I thought I was looking at an actual zombie. Which was fine, because you could add getting my brains eaten to the list of things I deserved right then. But then... What I saw, then he saw me and spoke. What are you doing here? He said so quietly, it was nearly a whisper. Get out, don't ever come back. I know I am the worst friend you could have. I should have at least talked to you before jumping to conclusions. All I want is 15 minutes to try and make things better. After that, I'll leave. I'll give you my three Ryan Stanberg rookie cards. I'll do whatever you want. I'll even finally try eating waffles with hand lotion for a syrup like your grandma sometimes tries to feed us. He glanced at me and looked away, but he did sit up, and I thought that a little color might have returned to his face. He nodded at me to continue, like a true friend would. First, Vince, I'm sorry I didn't believe you could have done that to me. It was ridiculous of me to think that, and you have a right to be mad. But just at least try to imagine how it looked from my standpoint. Please, before this, you never lied to me before. And then within days of each other, I find out that you lied to me about your grandma's birthday. Uh, you've been stealing money for our business, and you'd accept the payment for staples. Then go. F then my funds go missing. On the one day you happened to miss school for the first time in years, our funds. What? You said my funds, but they were our funds, Vince said, still not looking at me. Yeah, I said they were. You're right. I can see how that would probably look bad, Vince said. But still, I know, Vince, I should have trusted you above all else. That's why our business succeeded in the first place. I remembered that when I was thinking about how it was your idea for me to first hire Tiro back you, during the Graffiti Ninja debacle, I remember that it was still you who got this business started in the first place. It was your idea from the start because you recognized what we could do together, even as kindergartners. And I should have remembered those things when it, mat it mattered most, but I didn't. And I can't really forgive myself for that. This whole thing had me feeling paranoid. I just didn't trust anybody anymore, not even myself. And I guess sometimes I lost sight of the fact that our business had always been about you and me, not the money at all. It had never mattered how much money we made, not even for the Cubs World Series game. But I'm not going to make those mistakes again. You're probably the funniest, most trustworthy kid I'd ever met. I can't believe I ignored the fact even for a day or an hour or a second. Vince sighed. I'm sorry, too. This whole thing wasn't all your fault. I mean, I stole money from you. That's about as honest as telling a chimp to have th that having thumbs in your feet makes up for having to wear a diaper. I let out a laugh in spite of the mood. Your grandma? No, Vince said, shaking his head. My mom. Oh, I said, and stopped smiling. I remembered that I remembered then that he had said that she'd been acting crazy since losing her job. I guess I kind of knew how she felt because I kind of lost my job recently, too. So what I'm saying is I forgive you if you forgive me for stealing money and lying to you, Vince said. Well, because before you go getting sappy on me, I need to know one thing, I said. What was the deal with taking money from Staples? Vince actually chuckled. That's the thing, Mac. I had no idea that Barry Larson was Staples. It still blows me away. I grew up with that kid. He used to live just seven trailers down from me. I know. It shocked me when I found out too, I said. I remember playing football with him once or twice. Deep down, I think I kind of knew something was up when I when he stopped by that morning because I hadn't talked to Barry in a while, but I was so desperate for money. I think I just switched off my common sense there for a second. But why did he give it to you? Why why did you miss school that day? Barry's been trying to get me to sell my bike to him for years, Vince said. This time he offered me three hundred and fifty bucks for it, and I just couldn't resist. I mean, that pays our electricity our electric bill for like three months. He paid me half, and then he said he'd be by later that day, sometime before three, to pick it up and pay the other half. So I faked sick and stayed home. I know that whole scenario is so suspicious, and I should have known better, but being in this kind of mess does things to you. I especially should have known better when he never came by to get it. I mean, what kid just forgets to collect the merchandise at th that price? I can't believe I was that stupid. Vince must have been really strapped for cash to be willing to sell his bike. It was his dad's bike when he was a kid, a true vintage. For him to sell it under, under a grand or even to sell it for any price at all meant that things were really, really bad, 
were were really pretty bad for his family. It was basically the last part of his dad that Vince had left. Okay, deal. I forgive you if you forgive me, I said. Cue the music, Vince said, as he started wiping tears at his eye, from his eyes dramatically. I laughed. Whatever. I still can't believe you questioned my Cubs fandom, especially after I'm about to finally beat you. Bring it on, I said. What Hall of Fame Cub had the nickname Three Fingers? That was a tough one. I tried to cl clear my head, which was difficult considering. I still had to deal with sta the Staples issue. Though really, now that I had Vince back on my side, I felt like we could take down anybody. I felt like if we were going to pl we were playing on the Cubs together as pitcher and catcher right then, we'd break a 100-year-plus curse or even give guys like Greg Mattis and Mark Grace and Ramirez, uh, Ramirez and Carlos Zambrano and Ernie Banks hadn't been able to break. Mordecai Brown, I finally said. Vince shook his head in defeat. Well then, I grinned at him. All right, Vince, we still have to deal with Staples somehow. A lot has happened since I last talked to you. I proceeded to fill him in on the weekend's events. We called over Joe and the bullies to fill them all in as well. And then it was time to plan. We stayed up well past dark Sunday, formulating the master plan for Monday so that everybody that had happened that everything that had happened since saturday and everything that had led me up to this point what happened next would all depend on how staples reacted to my offer he was either going to accept it and we'd all go home or he would decline and the cops would be called in then again there was always option three he'd ignore my offer and simply and simply beat me into a bloody pulp